Well, hello there, and welcome to Mission Unstoppable. I know it's Thursday, and it's supposed to be Frankie Sense and more, but my guest today is so unstoppable, I had to have him on Mission Unstoppable, and you will see why in just a moment. His name is Kyle Bryant, and Kyle made a huge discovery, one that not only changed his life, but I think impacts the lives of anyone and everyone who reads his brilliant memoir, Shifting into High Gear. You see, whether you're able-bodied or you have a rare disease like Kyle, or you face having a hangnail, each of us has a choice about three things. One, how we choose to define ourselves. Two, what limits we place on ourselves. And three, how much of ourselves we're going to give back for the greater good. As time moved on, Kyle began to see that he was not in this disease by himself. There were opportunities for him to build community and be an example for others, despite the obstacles that lay before him. You see, he has Friedrich's ataxia, and the FA community and their families supported him. Now, Kyle chose to break free from his own self-imposed limits and, and his limited thinking. And, you know, that's something we talk a lot about on Mission Unstoppable. And he allowed that definition of himself to expand even as the disease took away some of his abilities. You see, it's a courageous person who shows up to really live life where others see defeat. So let's welcome Kyle and let him tell us how his journey unfolded. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And I really love those three points. I feel like I'm going to write them down and <laughs> like put them on the wall or something. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, on Mission Unstoppable, I like to tell, take people back to the very beginning, you know, what you were like as a kid and all that. Because, you know, where did that that come from and, and I know that from my own journey that that we don't know what we're what we're capable of doing or facing until we're actually facing that wall right, but right. let's look at, at at young Kyle I mean you were you ran around you, you you know you you ran exercise you're athletic you did all kinds of stuff yeah. uh, but you you were a little clumsy yeah, yeah. And, you know, my parents and my my family, um, my, my mom, my dad, and my brother, were, they were, we were always camping and hiking and biking and, you know, boating and all kinds of outdoor activities. And, um, you know, so when we noticed that my skills, my coordination was going downhill, specifically in baseball, um, everyone kind of went, wait a minute, what's going on here? And, you know, over a period of time after we started noticing these things, just little things in life, like I wasn't able to carry a glass of milk from the kitchen into the living room or, you know, stuff like that. Or I would trip and fall. My mom says she can go back to when I was like two years old. She couldn't let me go outside without shoes on. Because I would inevitably stub my toe, you know? Oh, wow. And okay. um, so all those things kind of started adding up. And that's when we started looking for answers. When I was about 15, 16 years old, it took about a year to get a diagnosis because even the doctors didn't even know what it, what it was. Um, and How rare finally, is that disease? How rare is Friedrich's ataxia? Uh, it is, so it affects one in 50,000 people. So okay. that's about 5,000 people in the U.S. and about 15,000 people worldwide. Wow. But the more striking thing is that one in 100 people are carriers and they don't even know. So like both of my parents are carriers, oh, but wow. they had no idea until the disease ended nobody, up. Nobody had it in their family that they knew of. They never even heard the word probably. Absolutely. I've never not. heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And is it kind of like a cerebral palsy ish? It's got um similar symptoms. Um, you know, it's got similar symptoms to like some to like C P to Parkinson's, ALS, um, you know, some of the muscular dystrophies, but the the cause is different than oh, okay. um some of those diseases. Right, right. So it's inherited. Yes, it's inherited. Yeah, so it's double recessive. So both of my parents are carriers, and I was the lucky recipient of both of their recessive genes. Um, and so that's how it showed up in me. Yeah. So 16, 17 year old Kyle, you get this news. How do you yeah. handle it? How do you handle it? Well, you know, I think. 
I grew up in an incredibly supportive household, and I was all I always knew in my heart that I could do whatever I want with my life, right? And yeah. uh, you know, obviously, that has lots of effects on a person, but you know, one of the main effects was that. I really felt like this is just an obstacle in my in like that I have to work with, not necessarily in my way, mm -hmm. but something else in my life. I try to be in and, and I have to admit that this isn't always how I saw it either. No, and that's you know? why I want to go to because you know I'm thinking of others who are faced with any diagnosis. Like you were, right. saying, you know, life shortening and, and, and just, hey, my, my life is going to change. Like, I mean, you were worried about going in a wheelchair. That was a big, big worry right. for you. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you're angry. You feel cheated. You feel like, hey, why yeah. am I singled out? Uh, why am I the lucky one? Um, and then things changed a little bit, you know, for you. So how did you get over the anger? And, and who were you angry with? So I... I that I think that was the most difficult thing is that there was no one to be angry with, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's his fault. Yeah. Um, and I think that we always try to find someone or something to blame, right? And yeah. so there was no one to blame, and so I felt like that the blame should be on me, right? And oh. so I think that was probably the hardest thing to deal with. Um, and obviously that's not logical. No. It's just the way I kind of, that default that my brain went to. And um, so, you know, so that was really tough. I, I faced a time where I was like, all right, light, life is over. Yeah. Your mind kind of goes to infinity you when, when you hear that. You're going to be in a wheelchair soon. You will likely die due to heart disease caused by FA. You'll lose all ability to take care of yourself. Your mind instantly goes to, oh, my gosh, my life is over. There's no reason to even see tomorrow. Like, Right. Did you think I about suicide? Well, I'm sorry? Did you think about suicide? I personally don't recall a time that I ever thought about ending it right now um but i don't you know i i don't pretend to admit that that's not the case for a lot of people who have sure. fa in, sure. in other difficult situations you know and that's i think that that's a perfectly acceptable thing to think right absolutely. i mean absolutely yeah no or, or at least way to get around it but i think that's a perfectly yeah. acceptable way to go it's like or, to i don't want to take the stuff in between let me just go right to the end and get it over yeah, kind of thing. yeah. What, about contingency plans i mean do you, i'm sure a lot of them put contingency plans and say hey when i get like this can you help me do this yeah yeah i've got i've got friends that that think and are thinking you know i don't want to be because this disease is progressive like yeah i would uh, you know as we were saying i was running around and 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 playing sports and stuff and now i use a wheelchair about 98 percent of the time the only time i don't is when i'm like standing up to brush my teeth or do dishes or something and so you know so Did there's I do dishes? <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm sorry <laughs> I said, yeah, you, i'll dishes. come over you want me to do yours <laughs> Yeah, could you? Um, <laughs> I love it. Um, so no, but there's there's a, a thought of like, okay, when when I get to this point, I don't ever want to see myself at this point, so I'm gonna end it. I mean, that's not the way I think, but I think that is an aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when was do you remember like your last normal day? Like, does that ever in your mind like, oh, that was the last day I absolutely felt normal? No, I don't. I don't ever think of that because I don't think of myself as abnormal. abnormal. Right, right. I, you know, I don't wake up every day and go, "Oh gosh, I'm I'm disabled again today." Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, you know what I mean? I see myself. I think the same as everyone else, but I just have this other this other thing in life that I have to figure out how to how to make work. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I think we all have those things, right? Everybody. I mean, there's things about us, about our lives that we wish were different. Yeah, 
Um, and we have to learn to, to deal with those and move forward despite or because of. And humor helps. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, you, um, you got your diagnosis and you thought about some stuff and you decided, you know what, heck it, I'm going to ride 2,500 miles across, you know, United States kind of thing. Yep. Um, and, and other people have done stuff like that. Terry Fox ran across the country. Other people, you know, I'm going to do it too. Cause that sounds like a cool thing. And it kind of proves your your strength, your manhood, maybe even your, your ability to yeah, you know, prove, do something, stuff, to prove yourself. something to yeah. yourself that you're still viable and you right. know, can, can do something. So tell us about you putting that ride together. And I mean, it was kind of cool to read about it in your book, Shifting into High Gear. I, I got, Cause I think talk about your dad and how he was before and after. Let's yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. Well, so let's start with me personally. Yeah. You know, I wanted to, like you said, I wanted to prove to myself that I wasn't this half rated human body that I maybe I could still be an athlete, you know, and I had to I had to prove that to myself before I could think of myself that way. And um so, you know, a a twenty five hundred mile bike ride, I, I was hoping that might help me. And uh <laughs> so, you know, and also I think that it was a similar thing for my whole family too. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe part of it is I'm always trying to prove to the people around me that I'm all right. Like, you know what? If I can ride my bike 25 and 100 miles across country, um, you know, maybe I'll be okay in life. Like, maybe I can do some other stuff as well. Right. Um, and take care of myself, you know? And so I think that was a big aspect of it. And I think... Part of it was, you know, proving to my parents that I could take care of myself um, because I think I talk about it in the book some too, but, um, you know, I th think that I wanted to prove that I was okay so that they didn't have to modify their lives because of my unfortunate situation. Right. Um, and, you know, I wanted them to go after their dreams and their hopes in life, even though I was dealing with this thing, because really in my mind, like it's not, it's not, a, a ter I hesitate to say that because it is a terrible thing for so many people, but in my mind, it's just another thing that I have to deal with, you know, and they, they can't quite grasp that because they're not in my shoes right they can try and they do as much as they can and i'm so grateful for that you know to empathize with my situation but they can't put themselves in there in my shoes no matter how hard they try and so you know i'm i think i'm constantly whether it's a good thing or a bad thing trying to prove to them that i can take care of myself and they don't need to change for me well, you know what? As a son, that's a beautiful thing to say. As a mom, yeah, I'm always gonna worry about you, kid. You're always gonna yeah. be a kid, no matter how old and big you get, right? You're always well, gonna be a kid. and no matter what the obstacle is, too, yeah, you're probably course. always gonna worry. So, oh, hey, I worry. My son has grown and has a baby, and I still go, "Oh, did he get home okay?" Did yeah, he yeah. I agree. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh my kids you yeah, do that okay. you're a mom i mean that's what we do so you have to just you know live with that part of it um okay so your dad wasn't super involved like he was kind of aloof not super emotional guy um uh, and you talked him into doing this but he wasn't and he wasn't even like really athletic he hadn't exercised for a little bit but you said hey dad you know what how'd you like to ride 2500 miles with yeah him? no i you know i think that he is probably better at giving me my space than my mom is <laughs> um you know and so he was i think he was doing that in the beginning and he at first he was only gonna ride with us first of all he didn't even own a road bike at all before like three weeks before the trip oh my God, that's amazing that, and, that's like commitment yeah and at first you know he was just gonna ride with us for like two weeks and then he had to get back to work um but his coworkers, his partners were so uh, supportive. And, you know, he got two weeks in, he's like, I have to stay for the whole thing, you know? And uh, that happened 
to my uncle too who joined us and he's like my only regret is that i didn't start at the beginning oh wow you know wow. because it was it was it was a lot of fun yeah it really yeah. was and now you had this bike custom built was um it so, bike, wasn't it yeah it's a recumbent bike it's not custom though anyone can go buy one um and so in the the one i started on it uh it's made in england but the one i read now it's made in florida by a company called catrack okay. and um, they make it an amazingly fast and light and comfortable and nimble machine that i just love so. now how much would a bike like that cost about three thousand dollars okay and so. i mean that's a professional bike yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, it's professional grand. I mean, across the country twice, so. <laughs> you know, I have, um, oh, geez, I better not say it. Okay, I'm going to say it. I'm embarrassed because I can't remember her name at the moment. But I did interview this, this, this girl twice, and she has a company that builds bikes for people with disabilities because she had a disability, and she used to be a huge bike rider. She rode, like, hundreds of thousands of miles on her bike. Yeah. Um, and now she sends them overseas to, you know, Africa and different places, but she has created some amazing looking bikes for, you know, if, if you ever need a design, like get, get in touch with Yeah. Them. But anyway. Yeah, I love uh, that. Well, yeah. and, you know, we work with a lot of different uh, companies that make adaptive equipment. Um, I run a program called the Ataxian Athlete Initiative, and we supply um, adaptive cycling equipment for people who have ataxia and um, want to want to get out there and ride so um how many people who have a taxi you know go gee i never thought of riding i'm gonna ride this sounds so cool um well hopefully a lot more now i think you know for me before i even started riding i saw somebody who was riding and he had ms okay and i was like oh my gosh maybe i can do that too and so now hopefully i'm that person that is writing and somebody else is saying, Oh my gosh, maybe I can do that too. Yeah. So, okay. I have to ask you on, on that first ride, you had a couple of guys from Italy join you. Who yeah. were they? What happened with these guys? How did they get in touch with you? How did they get onto this ride? And, and you know, kind of what happened? <laughs> yeah. Really so funny. leading up to the ride, you know, I was posting on social media. Actually, I didn't know if I had Facebook at the time, but uh, I had a blog. So lots of people around the world were reading my blog, and that was so incredibly encouraging. Um, but anyway, so this Italian guy uh, named Marco reached out to me and uh, said, hey, we want to come join Yaz Fe. And he said, hey, we want to come join you for a stretch of the ride night. So I said, yeah, that sounds great, you know. So they joined us for the last like 400 miles, I think, from from uh, uh, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, up all the way up to Memphis. So, um, now did I but, get this right, Kyle? He he couldn't ride with his legs; he rode with his arms. Right. So yeah, he rode a hand cycle, um, powered solely by his arms. Yeah. Wow, he must have had massive. I yeah, see. he was he was pretty ripped. I I got on it one day and I like went around the parking lot and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how somebody could do this all day. Yeah. Um, but you know, as we started riding together, it became apparent that this ride. So the the whole character transformation, um, in me. Yeah. You know, as I, as we wrote this book, my ride, my amazing writer Alex Schnitzler, he he was like, "All right, we have to identify a character transformation." And you know, at the beginning of the ride, it was all about me. I wanted to prove something to myself. I wanted to do this for me. Yeah. And then through the ride, I realized that I was just a piece of this huge community that was working to cure this disease and that I can make an impact. So Marco, when he joined us, he hadn't come to that realization and his ride was about him. And I cannot blame him because I was totally like that at the beginning of my ride, right? Yeah. And so it became 
kind of a conflict of interest because, you know, we were, we were in it for the community. We had had time to realize this was our role. All of us, yeah. And um, he was in a different place. Um, and you had and, an agenda. Like, you were trying to ride X number of miles a day. You had a... Right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he wasn't quite... Per- we had ridden 2,000 miles together already. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, he had just come from Italy and put his bike on the road and was trying to keep up with our pace. And it just... There was a lot of things that just did not match up between us and him. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, we had to part ways during this trip. I'm I'm spoiling it for everybody, but it, there's a lot more details. Oh, there's a lot of details. Story. We're not going to talk about it anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that transformation. Because, um, yeah, I mean, you ride in anger, you ride in all this stuff, and then it's like, wait a minute, you stop at a certain place and, and people come out and there's somebody there with, you know, with FA and there's a kid or there's, you know, yeah. a mom or a dad and they say, Hey, you know, like you're really inspiring me. And we're all those pit stops kind of post marks for your change. Like, absolutely. Like, Big wow, time. wow. Because there were all sort of checkpoints to be like, you know, what? it's not about you. It's about all of us. And this journey can be way more fulfilling and impactful if you think of the whole, everybody else and yeah. not just you, you know? Yeah. And, so, and just um, you doing it too is, is like they're doing it. If you can do it, yeah. I can do it. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think everyone sees, everyone in the FA community hopefully sees a little of them in me. Yeah. And I see myself in them too, you know? And so it really is a situation where we're all in this together. So you, you actually created a job out of that for yourself, didn't you? Well, yeah. So, um, I mean, I was, I was working at an engineering firm in Sacramento, California, where I lived at the time. And um, so when I did my second bike ride, um, we did a ride from uh, uh, Sacramento, California to Las Vegas, Nevada. And I was like, all right, like this is what I want to do with my, the rest of my life. On that ride, we raised $150,000. Wow. We had raised a total of over 200000 at that point. And I was like, all right, maybe there's something to this, you know. I've been writing a blog and um, lots of people were following the blog and commenting and like, all right, maybe I'm empowering the community. Maybe there is something to this. So I worked with um, the leadership at the Friedrichs Taxi Research Alliance. It took us about a year to figure out what the position would be and what I would do and all that. But um, now I'm on staff. I've been on staff at DeFerra since 2000 october 2009 and um wow it is just incredibly fulfilling we built a series of bike rides around the country we have six different locations and each ride well we we've raised a million dollars wow in the past three years in a row and um so you know and the thing is with is the rides, money or, or different families or a mix of both. Well, so we have we have some of our rides have up to like five, six hundred people. Oh wow! One of those people gets a fundraising page. Yeah, and they send out to their network. You know, hey, I'm doing this ride for a cause that really means a lot to me. Would you sponsor me? You know, and that's how all the money gets raised. We do, do have a few. How do you keep 500 people? I mean, I've done motorcycle rides. Like, <laughs> how do you do 500 people on a bike and keep them all, like, safe? Yeah. Um, I have an amazing partner that I work with, that, a co-organizer named Jamie Young, and she does she takes care of all the details wow if anyone has a good time at ride a taxi event it's because of jamie young Uh, um you know we work really closely together um but she just keeps track of it all and we we do try to 
take every measure we can in making sure everybody's safe and having a really good time. So do you have you do you go on every ride now still? Uh, yeah, I do every ride. We've got a uh, ride six coming up. Yeah, six times a year. I do I do rides and then you know I ride a lot by myself um or with friends on the bike trail here in Pennsylvania as well. So um last year I rode about fifteen hundred miles. This year, I will do the same and hopefully get to around 2,000. We'll see. But um, I, tra I travel about 100 days a year. And, to you know, partly to ride a taxi events, but also to our series of grassroots fundraisers. I get to as many as I can and just basically go say thank you. poster boy. Please. Yeah, I get to I get to thank people for their work and their donations. So I basically get to be grateful for a living. I think that's a pretty incredible uh incredible thing to be able to do. No kidding. Wow, that's awesome. And you know, it really comes it shines through you. Your spirit oh. it really does. Like wow. Thank Gratitude you. Is, is a big thing. And um okay, so you're going to all these events and you're traveling and can I ask how old you are now? I'm 37. Woo! Okay. 37 years old. And how are, how's your health right now? My health is good. I, uh, you know, I just got a rowing machine that sits right next to my bed. And so every morning I get up and I, I row for about 25 minutes and that gets me ready for the day. You know, it's been... Obviously, winter and cold outside here in Pennsylvania, so I haven't ridden my trike outside yet this year. But I'm um, really looking forward to that. I think it's going to happen any day now. So, um, Well, I, I'm in Ontario, in, in just outside Toronto, and I see guys riding in the winter, because like, we got a lot of snow. Like, we, our weather's like you, but they have these tires, these giant tires on their bikes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? And they're out there, I guess they're like a mountain bike kind of tire, but bigger, yeah. and they're out riding in the snow. I wouldn't encourage it, but yeah, I know I'm, you know, you mentioned that I'm 37 now, which is not young anymore. And I'm, I'm becoming a fair weather cyclist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I get that. The, it was, it was different when I was like 25, you know, I'd you go out in <laughs> sub freezing weather and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I know. I hear you on that one. You know, and just doing, just being that motivated and, and having that kind of discipline to get out of bed and row for 25 minutes, you know, yeah. able-bodied or not, right? right? That is, you know, incredible stamina. And, and so how, what do you say to people to motivate them? You know, like, what do you say to them and say, you know, man, like, you got to stay in shape. Like, you got to, like, do something. You got to. Yeah, I don't. I think it's. I, I think talk it's to me hard. I need this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's hard to put it into words, um, because I I just have not found a good way to say it, and so I try to do it by example, you know. And that's what really resonates with me when I see somebody that's, um, you know, in shape and doing well, and. Th that's what I want to want to have too for my life, and so really I tr try to talk less and do more. I mean, obviously it doesn't always work out the way I do talk a lot, <laughs> but um, you know that's one of the things you walk that your I talk. try to do. Yeah, you walk your talk. So, um, are you in any pain at all? Not moment to moment. Um, you know there are when when I don't. When I sit around in my chair and in my office chair and just, you know, I'm very stagnant for a number of days at a time, yeah. I start getting back issues and stuff like that. But as long as I stay active, I can usually fend that stuff off for now. Good for you. What are, and people who don't know about your disease, can you tell them a bit, other, some of the other symptoms that might come with it? So Friedrich's ataxia, the main symptom is um, balance and coordination issues. It also includes um, vision loss, hearing loss, and life-shortening heart complications, um, scoliosis and diabetes in, in a, a number of people as well. Um, but, you know, the heart 
issues is what takes people's lives too early. Um, and so that's a, a really scary thing that a lot of our, uh, a lot of my friends live with daily. You know, they, their heart is having issues. Um, but you know, they're, you they're from all the exercise you do. Yeah. So far I am very fortunate that I have not had any heart issues yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it's a progressive disease. And yeah. so, you know, it's a matter of having regular checkups and just making sure all this stuff stays on track. Are you, are you eating a special diet? Um, I try to, I'm, I'm eating pretty low carb right now. I, I feel like that really helps me feel better. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm trying to do that. Um, you know, with any of this stuff, it no doesn't. Bread or donuts or chips. <laughs> yeah, no, I try not to. And I've gotten to the point where I notice my body feeling differently. Yeah. And that's starting to overpower the feeling of, oh my gosh, this would taste so good right now. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm excited about that, that, that like mentally I'm able to control those cravings a little better because I know, I know what makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah. And have they noticed that? Um, I don't know. In, in other, other folks who have, FA like have they tried diet to see if that basically you're like on a keto diet I think right yeah more or less I mean I I, I don't think I'm in ketosis but um Not as low. yeah yeah but I don't there so far there are no specific uh, um, recommendations for diet for FA but it's like anything else just if you eat well everything's gonna work better right yeah i mean because you mentioned diabetes it it could be a result and so you would think if you ate a little lower carb like it would it might help that yeah no i don't i don't disagree with that i mean i'm no i'm no doctor but i would think that as well (laughs) (laughs) we could pretend though (laughs) let's just tell people how to live their lives i think we could do that pretty well so the research that is being done with all this money that you're being raised are you in on are you like in the driver's seat of that? Like, do you get to go behind the scenes and go, what are they doing for me? And, and Well, so I, I do, you know, I work, I'm on staff at the Friedrichs Taxi Research Alliance. And um, we have a really good handle on all of the research that's going on all over the world. I'm not going to pretend that I do, but, you know, I go into my executive director's office and, uh, you know, she tells us about, all the most exciting stuff that's going on right now. And I live about 35 miles away from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And that's sort of our our worldwide hub for um, clinical research. And so I participate in that clinical research quite a bit. And um, What, like taking drugs or taking... So um, I... So there are clinical trials going on right now. And, and when I say clinical trial, I mean a, a study that actually tests a medication or an intervention. Right. Um, and also there are clinical studies that don't necessarily uh, involve an intervention, but they, they're, they're working to tell us more about the disease. Like, for example, I just went in the other day for a cardiac MRI. And they're looking at the hearts of people with FA to see what they can learn about the disease to try to design um, new approaches to treatment. Right, right. Is there a difference between men and women? Do more of one gender get it than the other? Or Nope. It is it equal is opportunity. Equal opportunity, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cause I know that even in heart disease, they treat it differently between men and women. You know, we experience the drugs differently and things like that. Um, okay, so they're looking at, at prevention more than... So, so there are several approaches. There are a lot of different approaches to treating FA. And um, so real quick, just a, a quick um, tutorial yeah, on DNA, right? I, yeah. 
And assume, when I say DNA, don't like shut your brain off, right? Yeah, right? don't shut your brain off. <laughs> so DNA is a series of codes. One of those codes is GAA. Now, you have less than 30 GAA repeats at that point in your DNA. I have over 450. Wow. Some of my friends with the FA have over 1,000 repeats. When that code gets decoded, it makes a protein called Fritaxin. And the code in me and my friends with the FA, the code gets messed up, and I don't make enough Fritaxin. That is the underlying cause of the disease. So and they can't give you that. Right. You can make Fritaxin. However, it needs to get into the mitochondria, which is protected by two membranes. And so it's hard to get it in there. And so there is a, a drug called Tad Fritaxin that they're working on right now um, that attaches this thing called TAT attaches itself to Fritaxin and it ushers it inside the mitochondria and gets it to where it needs to go. Wow, so, fascinating. Some of the approaches work on delivering Fritaxin. Some of them work on helping the body use Fritaxin more efficiently so you don't need as much. Um, and some of them help wor work on like basically tricking the body into making more Fritaxin. And then there's gene therapy, which is a big topic. Um, but it delivers gene therapy. The principle is that it will deliver a good copy of the gene so that the body uses that to make Fritaxin in this case um, instead of the, the dysfunctional copy. So lots of really exciting things going on. What about CBD oil? Does that help? Have you tried it? Um, I am not sure about CBD oil. I haven't um, read any studies or heard anything specifically on FA. Yeah, I know with, um, is it Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis, MS? There was a guy on, on that had that had it and, you know, he had the tremors, he had everything and, and when he did the oil, it, it, every, it all went away magically in five minutes. It was wow, gone. It was amazing. That's amazing. It was amazing. So I don't know. Yeah, it's something to natural cures sometimes are good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll keep my eyes out for that for sure. Yeah. So okay, we got a ride happening when? And ride in Dallas on April sixth. That's our next one. So we're really excited about that. Yeah, you get out Fundraising of for that ride is going gangbusters right now. So that's really exciting. And how and, far is um, that ride? So there are different route lengths. All of our rides include different route lengths oh, okay. for anyone to come out. So we have we have a six mile and a twenty five mile and a fifty mile route. Um, so anyone can come on and have a good time with us. So, so they're all a one day ride. That's right. Yeah, now they are. Yep. And you're doing long any long distance through the year? One big one or? Um. I don't, I don't have a super long distance one planned, but uh, this year the big ride is going to be um, a mountain in Southern California called White Mountain. Uh, me and my, my friend Sean, actually he was, his organization is called Determinants, and um, they um, are going to ride up White Mountain this year. It's over 14,000 feet. It'll be all off-road. I've never really ridden off-road before, so this is going to be quite an adventure. And <laughs> you're going to try it on a mountain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A mountain trike. Oh, a mountain trike. Oh, a trike. Well, actually, there's a brand called Mountain Trike, so uh. it's not particularly that brand, but yeah. it will have three wheels. It's going to be a cow trike, and it's going to be equipped to uh, scale the mountain. That's so cool. Wow. And you yeah. get excited about this. Yeah, no, I am I am really excited about that. I mean, it's not until August, but I'm already planning for it, you know? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. I think my dad's going to come down, my uncle, and so we're, we're all going to tackle the mountain together. That is so cool. All the usual suspects getting back together. That's right. The game. Yeah. 
the gang is coming. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, what do you what do you want to say to somebody newly diagnosed with any disease that, that is progressive or that that you know is going to be scary? I mean, nobody yeah. knows what's going to happen. We, I mean, I I could get hit by a bus today, and I'm gone, right? right? Like you yeah. you have a you know they say, well, it's life shortening, but who knows when? Or nobody has a date. Um, so what do you tell people like? Go live your life. Like, don't worry about it. The, the most, the mo no, uh, the opposite. You know, you think part of the the message. You think it, the message might be ignore it and get on with your life, but I. Ha it's actually quite the opposite. Face up to it and learn as much as you can about FA and about yourself with FA too. Look, mm -hmm. look inside and. The number one thing I think is connect with other people who have FA or whatever your condition is. Right. Um, and, you know, for me, when I met somebody, well, when I meet somebody else who has FA, there's a shared understanding that no one else understands. Um, and as you can imagine, I, you are an absolutely empathetic person, but there's no way you can be in my brain, no matter what, right? Right. But when I meet somebody else with the FA, there's that shared understanding. Oh my gosh, you know how it is. You like, we almost don't even have to say it. it's, yeah. it's incredible it's because we don't even have to talk about FA, right? We, yeah. can, <laughs> we can get past it because... That's the starting point. And so I think my main advice is to connect with other people who have your condition. So, Are you dating? <laughs> Whoa, we're getting personal now. Uh, no, I am not. I am I'm working on my, my own stuff for now, right? And, uh, <laughs> 37, I don't know, I'm working on my own stuff. Is that a cop-out? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a nice girl with F.A. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> You're a cute guy, Kyle. I'm sure it's pretty hard. <laughs> well, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. So what's next? Well, so, I mean, the thing that I'm really focused on is supporting the science that is going to treat and cure Friedrich's ataxia. Um, and so, you know, I'm really focused on my role at FARA and, um, you know, convening the community to help raise money. And we all, we all do it together and um, really push things along. And so, um, you know, while I hesitate to put, I, I, I don't ever really want to put a time frame on it. We really do think it's right around the corner. Um, and hopefully that corner is closer than, than we would think. And, you know, all of our efforts are focused on reducing the amount of time that it takes. And um, so, you know, that's what I want to keep doing and that's what I'm focused on at all times. But was there um, a time when, you know, uh, if I didn't consume you and yeah. you thought, gee, I really want to do this in my life or I really want to make sure I do this for my life. And is there a dream or a goal that you, that you wanted that you didn't do or that you might look at doing? Um, you know, I, when I when I was diagnosed with that, day, I don't think that I really have ever thought, um, you know, this thing is in the way, and I, I you know, it's going to prevent me from reaching the things that I want to do. I don't know. Maybe I never really before that, day, maybe I never really had a clear vision. Well, you were of, young. Yeah, of of what I wanted for my life. Um, I also think that that's a really tough thing is to visualize what we want in life and choose the things we want because I think it's easy to imagine that we can go after those things if we can only think of what they are, right, and really hone in on exactly what we need to do to get there. Um, and so especially before, I mean, I was 
diagnosed when I was 17, I don't think I had a real clear vision. Well, I'm just talking about even like, you know, oh, I, I always wanted to play guitar or, or I wanted to go to Alaska or I, you know, just things in life, that everyday things in life that people, you know, like yeah. to do and learn I, I, things or... Yeah, no, I I don't think that I've ever really um, felt like FA has prevented me from those things, and you know, and so I'm not sure that. I mean, sure, if I if I wanted right now, if I really wanted to visit Alaska, I'd be there next week. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so you got everything you need. You're you're like the poster boy for FA. You're. you're <laughs> You're going to cure it and you're going to support it and you're going to make everybody who has it feel so much better about themselves because you're already doing that. You really are. You're making all of us feel better. And I'm sure you're making your parents feel better too. I, I have to have, I'm sure that you are. They can yeah, see. Yeah, I think so. I mean, got it together together. And, yeah. Yeah. So. You got it together, Kyle. Thank you. Yeah. I am no. so glad there's somebody like you in this world. I really am. And I mean that from my heart. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to go back to something you said at the beginning, which is something about how we see ourselves. That's one of the choices that we have. And yeah. I think that's what, you know, what the bike ride, what my book has taught me, um, you know, writing a book forced me to take a look at all this stuff and forced me to take a look at myself like, how have I transformed and how do I actually see myself in this situation? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I've been going through that last few years, you know, reframing how I see myself and how I fit into this community. And so, I, you know, that was one of the things I really liked about what you said at the beginning. So, well, yeah, how, sorry. Can can you provide some insight into into how that relates to other situations? Well, you know, what? I, you said it for a reason. I did say it for a reason because I, I had a serious motorcycle accident. I was in the hospital for six months. Also, go, you know, going through a transformation. I had a lot of loss at that time, and you know, you can choose to blame other people. You can choose to be right. angry. You can choose to to say, okay, um, I'm going to step up and 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 not live with blame and not be a martyr and not be, you know, this horrible person who's always, I mean, I'm always in pain, but people go, Oh, I didn't know you were in pain. Like you, you know, you're smiling or you're happy or you're cheerful or whatever. That's a choice. I don't want yeah. to be that miserable person. Right. right? That's a choice yeah. that we have, how we want to present ourselves to the world and how, you know, we want to think. I mean, if you think positive, you will be positive. And if you think negative, you'll be negative. And I, I have a feeling like you're the same kind of person when I was in the hospital. I went around and go, so, you know, were your parents positive or negative? I'm trying to understand where does this come from, the, this ability right. to move forward right. where other people, like I said, have a hangnail. There was a girl next to me who had a hangnail and she was like screaming. I'm like, oh my God, there's a guy <laughs> who was just consumed by fire. Like he should be screaming, not you. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, so people's ability to handle pain or people's ability to handle different situations um, are different, but at the same right. time, it's a choice that you get to make. And you like, you, like you're out there telling people you can choose, you know, to sit at home and not do these bike rides or feel sorry for yourself, or you can, you can choose to, to uh, be a support for other people and to give yeah. back to the world and, and be, you know, really immerse yourself and make friends with it and face it and live with it and absolutely. you're going to have a way different life than the person who's going to sit at home and do absolutely nothing and just cry all day because it's yeah. always me right yeah yeah and the the first step i feel like is facing up to it and learning about it instead of running away mm -hmm. do the opposite go go to it and realize that all right, this thing is a part of me now. There's nothing, no way I can change that for the moment. So let's work with it and uh, and connect with the others that seem to be doing all right. You know what? And maybe I can copy what they're doing and use some of their successes in yeah. my life. Yeah. And I mean, modeling good behavior is something that we do all through our life, whether you're in sales mm -hmm. or, you know, you you want to be anything you know in, in one of my books i talk about you want to be something well 
go and find that person and model it. Pretend that you're them. Pretend that you're a person with FA that is successful, that, that you know, right. is able to get through right. the day and get on their bike and, and exercise on the rowing machine and eat well. If that's who you want to be, if you want to be a healthy person with it, this is what, these are the steps you're going to take and you're going to model Kyle's behavior. Yep. Yeah. Well, and, you know, not just mine, but like, like well, I said, you know, I, I look at other people in the community and I take pieces of what they teach me and apply it to my own life, you know, right. and I, I think that's probably a big part of being in a community is contributing and, but also benefiting as well, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think, you know, definitely humor helps. And if you can, you know, laugh in the face of danger or, or yeah. gravity or whatever. I think that, that it definitely helps. I I agree, you know, and that um, brings me to, you know, I have a podcast with a friend named Sean Bombsark, and um, we just have so much fun on our podcast. It's called Two Disabled Dudes, and um, the principle is that, you know, by talking about our disabilities directly it takes the power away from the negative power away from what they have on our lives and um so i mean a lot of our conversations have nothing to do with that way and a lot of times we're just making fun of each other and cracking up um but you know it's our it's our choice and um to use humor right yeah, to yeah. combat this disease so yeah that's awesome i love it can't wait to listen to that thank uh, you how do you do it every week uh yeah we we have a show once a week now yeah we have um we have like 70 episodes now so wow yeah yeah are and it's live? available i'm sorry are, are they live episodes or we haven't done a live one yet we've done a few that are live taped um, so like we'll do one in front of a live audience, but then we'll release it like, you know, a week later or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that's, so I need to grill you about how to get our stuff live. No, um, no, I'll be happy to show you. <laughs> hey, I just know, I just noticed that under, under your, your window, it says Paula. This is Kyle. <laughs> 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 so Paula. <laughs> that's yeah, uh, that's me. Listen, my friend, we are out of time, and I want to thank you so much for being my guest today. You are truly absolutely a person, and I just was, loved having you. Loved having you on the show, and I, I hope you know that 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 you continue to uh, be in touch because I just love your uh, love who you are. Thank you. Yeah, I know it was my pleasure. It was an absolutely wonderful conversation, and I really appreciate the insight that you. You bring to all your conversations. So oh, thank you. So thank you. Goodbye, Facebook. <laughs> We're heading out. <laughs> all right, one sec.